name is Jim Walker. I'm from Hortonworks, um, Director of Product Marketing. And I want to talk today about uh, Apache Hadoop and the cloud and kind of where all these worlds collide and how they come together. Unfortunately, you know, I don't have a demo plan in this. Uh, I do have a cluster up and running, so you know, if all fails, maybe I can run off and go, go check that out. But um, you're very welcome to go off and, and download our software or you know, try our virtual sandbox and all these different things yourselves as well. Hopefully this is uh, interesting enough to you that, that you'll go off and do that today. So, you know, Hadoop and, and big data is just kind of a really big space these days. There's a lot of hype. Uh, you know, is it hype or is it reality? You know, I like to think about, you know, this, this introduction of the elephant way back in 1941, right? So in 1941, well, we learned that elephants can fly with Tumbo, right? But in 2012, well, I think elephants can walk on clouds. So it's a little bit different, a little bit of a a different take on things, but you know, th this has really been this inception of this new marketplace has come about us very quickly, right? Um, you know, according to IDC, we look at the big data market in general. You know, we're sitting here around 2012, so it's around you know four and a half, five billion uh, in in dollars at this point, right? And so we're looking at 2015 in terms of all technology services across all the segments. You know, we're looking at a market around 17 billion that that they're kind of predicting at this point. Um, so when you know people come to me and say, "Is this big data thing real?" Well, I think uh, I think it's very real. I think there's a lot of people who are getting a lot of value from Hadoop and some of the other big data technologies today. And I'm going to go through some of those with you. Um, when we look at these things, though, you know, I, I Wikibon's a, a great resource for information about big data and Hadoop. I think the team over there is doing a great job. Them in Silicon Angle. Uh, sorry, a little commercial for my friend Jeff Kelly over there, but you know, I use a lot of his stuff. If we look at the big data market segments, well, these look like stuff that we've been dealing with for a long time, right? We have hardware, software, you know, the ETL, analytics, applications, uh, and then, you know, services on top of all this. And then, you know, down below we have these kind of next generation data warehouses. But, you know, within the analytics and kind of how we go about deploying and using applications within our organizations today, this all looks very familiar to me. This is stuff that, you know, I've been dealing with for years. I'm not going to age myself and give you numbers, but... You know, this is all stuff we've been dealing with, and so if we look at to see where, you know, Horton Works plays in particular, well, we are a Hadoop distribution, so yeah, we're definitely software there, and then, you know, we're also a services company, so we're going to provide services and training on top of that. But, you know, I think the cloud is applicable really across all this stuff in the middle. I mean, it's kind of the hardware side, but when we think about it in terms of what we're using, well, there's a bunch of different tools that we're using within the cloud to. You know, uh, get the you know get an elastic presence, or just kind of expand our organization very quickly. And so, really, I'm going to focus on really the the intersection between Hadoop and the cloud, really for the next part of this this presentation. But um, so, when we look at Hadoop and why Hadoop is kind of becoming this big thing, I mean, you know, the history of Hadoop I'll come back into. But you know, if we think about analytics and the way that people are are you know looking at their data today, well. You know, it started a while back. Uh, you know, we started to deal with purchase details and purchase records, payment records, right? And so, you know, within our ERP systems, we were dealing dealing with megabytes of data, right? And then along came CRM data, and we wanted to integrate, you know, our customer with our with our ERP data, right? So we're looking at customer touches, um, we're looking at all our contacts, our accounts, you know, opportunities, all the touch points that are happening. Uh, within our CRM application, we're butting that up with you know purchases, right? So now we can say, you know, how many touches did it get to? So how many touches did it take so that we can get to a purchase or whatnot, right? So there's some advanced analytics we were able to do there, and that really kind of pushed us into uh, gigabytes of data. And down across the horizontal scale, well, it was, you know, there was a larger variety, and well, the data is getting a bit more complex, right? We're looking at you know historical data, we're looking at you know the timeliness of the data and whatnot, right? So and then came a third layer, and this was really all the web data that we've been dealing with for you know, the past couple of years. I think you know we we've known the data was there, but I'm not sure everybody uh, was adopting it in terms of using it as part of their analytics, right? And so you know, um, you know we saw companies like Amazon, you know, really blaze the trail with dynamic pricing. Um, you know, I think everybody is just kind of uh, you know enraptured, and there's a whole market around search marketing and all these things. But there's a lot of data that is coming in from these sources that really starts to kind of expand really analytics up into terabytes of data. And I think, well, there's some applications that are out there. I think some of the next generation data warehouses 
you know, the MPP stuff and these, you know, highly scalable databases can deal with this. Um, you know, they, where they lose and where they start to fall off the cliff is when we get into really the big data. And so, you know, the way that we define big data is a little bit different than, you know, some of the other organizations that are in the space. We think of it as this kind of equation in the upper right here. You know, it's transactions plus interactions plus observations is going to equal big data, right? And so the transactions, the CRM, the ERP stuff, you know, the interactions is all the web. And then there's all this observation data as well. So it's really kind of a, an accumulation of all these different things, right? I mean, you know, these are just stuff that we haven't been able to deal with before. If we think of all the different sensors in the world that are creating data as we speak right now, we get into just massive amounts of data. You know, um, you know, what would it take to take uh, sensor data off your car and have that affect the way that your insurance prices are? Because we know what kind of driver you are. You know, how am I able to understand? Uh, you know, perhaps there's sensors in say a microwave or some consumer product that you know we're feeding back this information into some sort of uh, product development resource so we can create better products, right? And we could have a more intelligent product design, right? Well, we just weren't able to collect this data before. Um, the rate at which the world is creating data is just intense at this point, but I don't need to preach to the choir here. Um, how do we actually take advantage of that? And that's really where, you know, big data and dupe has come about, right? So when I think about, you know, what were the original drivers behind these things, well, I think the cloud and Hadoop share many different things, right? Um, from a business driver point of view, you know, well, the cloud is more of a kind of infrastructure, kind of more a play, more technical and financial, you know, Hadoop was really there to kind of enable new business models, right, and drive faster growth of revenue, right? How do I find a competitive advantage over my, over my, you know, over the others in my marketplace, right? You know, how am I able to do, say, a social graph analysis so I understand who it is in the marketplace that is affecting the rest of the community in terms of their sentiment about my company. Oh my God, this is not stuff I was able to do before Hadoop, right? This was stuff that people were relying on, you know, kind of the next generation data warehouse to do, but find it increasingly difficult to deal with this, right? So there's a lot of reasons why from a business driver point of view, we'll come back to those a little bit further uh, in the presentation, but there's lots of reasons there. Um, there's a lot of text technical drivers, right? Uh, data, of course, continues to grow exponentially. You know, if I look at my iPhone that sits here next to me, I just try to imagine how much data that thing creates each day and then start to multiply that by the number of phones that are out there in the marketplace today and start to think about, you know, how much data there is, right? Um, it's everywhere. It's in lots of different formats, um, which is another big challenge, right? When I have structured data, well, it's easy for me to figure out analysis and deal with that. How do I make sense of unstructured data to start to identify patterns that I could then feed into business analytics tools, right? And ultimately, if they're going to go into business analytics, well, how do I refine these things? How do I refine lots of data to boil it down into what makes, you know, uh, something that's of value within a business analytics tool? Another, you know, big technical driver. We have lots of different complicated data, right? And so, quite honestly, a lot of the solutions that are out there, they just really weren't fit for this kind of growth, right? We need to translate this new world of big data into kind of how it's going to work with the existing tools that we have. Um, you know, finally, there's the financial drivers. And of course, I mean, you know, we're, we're on this presentation really the, the entire day is, you know, really driven by different economic models of how we come to market and how we actually deploy things within our organizations. And, you know, there is cost advantages uh, about going to the cloud. There's cost advantages about commodity hardware. Um, there's huge cost advantages within just the whole open source and how that model really changes marketplaces, right? And so I think it's really a combination of the business, the technical, and financial drivers that has really driven this need for this next generation data architecture. And I think, you know, Hadoop and the cloud, uh, both of them either together or separate, are really kind of sharing the last two there. So what is Apache Hadoop? Um, you know, Hadoop, you know, really started... Oh gosh, I guess back in 2004 at Yahoo, as uh, you know, some guys were trying to build a better search engine, right? They were, they were tasked with basically going out there and ingesting what was the equivalent of the internet every day back in 2004, massive amounts of data, uh, and making sense of that so they can provide better search. And so there was a team of really smart engineers at, uh, at Yahoo that developed this new framework called Hadoop. Um, you know, Hadoop, so, so Hadoop has been around really since about 2004, right? And so as, as an Apache project. 
Um, so it's one of the best examples of open source really driving innovation and creating a market. Um, I love those terms because it is really kind of opening up this new world of big data. It's, it's one of the big drivers within this whole big data space that you know, we've all been hearing about today, right? It's the foundation of many new solutions. Um, and quite honestly, it, it, it is really driven by these things on the previous slide, right? What is this new economics model? How, how is it going to financially uh, be beneficial to me? Right? If I can run things on commodity hardware and go out and you know, buy a bunch of servers or, hey, even better, you know, go to my cloud provider and just rent a bunch of servers very cheaply, uh, and and really without concern of what that you know what it's not an appliance it's commodity hardware. Well, that's really going to change the way that you know I'm dealing with really the cost structure behind analytics or the cost structure behind you know the application that I want to deploy. Right. So, you know, Hadoop is is really kind of a driver of this kind of new world around big data. Right. And it does make a lot of sense to do, you know, Hadoop in the cloud, right? So within some of the reasons, well, it's going to bring access to Hadoop to a lot more end users. Um, like I mentioned at the very beginning, if you want to go out and try our sandbox, you know, you can go out and visit our website and, and go start to play around with Hadoop today. Um, there are those samples and demos and all these different things, right? And that's bringing access to this stuff to everybody. You know, I don't need to have, you know, five servers uh, underneath my desk that I deploy a cluster on, it's complicated. I, I just don't have that all the time to play with it, right? And so it's really bringing it to everybody, right? Um, it's really easing this installation and configuration. It's, you know, what Sebastian just showed on the, on the previous slide, you know, how do I just deploy a cluster without huge amounts of, uh, you know, deployment, right? I don't need to do CLI into each server and, and figure out what that's going to be. I just need to deploy a cluster, right? Make that easy to configure and install, right? Um, and when it's all done, it's kind of uh, it's already you know kind of there and tested, right? It's kind of it's an enterprise-ready distribution, if you will, right? And then uh, if I have it in the cloud, how do I integrate with Hadoop? Well, Hadoop has many different related projects. One of which I'm going to talk about a little bit is called Age Catalog, which really opens up Hadoop to uh, a, race, a RESTful API, which is something simple and easy to understand for most developers in the world, right? Uh, how do I spin up a cluster on demand? Right? If I want to just try some things out and maybe I have a short-term project that needs to take advantage of Hadoop because I have petabytes of data that I'm ingesting and dealing with, how do I just spin up a cluster quickly so I could maybe run a one-off project against it? Right? So the cloud does make sense really in, in, in that sense of uh, the kind of deployment and type of things. Right? So it's not going to make sense in every case, but I think it's you know, really down to what you're trying to do. Right? And so you know, Steve is a, a fellow Horton worker. He has a blog, and, he, and this is he talks about you know running Hadoop in the cloud. So I'll, I'll pass out the slides, but it's Steve Lawford at .blogspot.com. And in March, he wrote this pretty good uh, blog post, and, and you know he's taught me a lot about this. But you know, he starts his entire blog with his entire blog post on Hadoop in the cloud with uh, you know people say, should I run Hadoop in the cloud? And really, there's no answer. And they'd say it depends, and I think that's what. Like a lot of things we do in IT, well, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. But, you know, when I boil down really his five reasons, um, as you ask these things yourself, it comes down to really these are the, the key takeaways I feel for my presentation today. And I'll summarize these at the end of our, of our time together as well. But, you know, if your data is stored in the cloud, then, you know, local analysis may make sense, right? So do I want to do the work near the data? If it's already there, then let's get a Hadoop cluster up and running and deal with it there. Do I want to be moving this data around? I mean, it's probably very bulky. Um, so if it's up there, let's not move it. Let's spin up a cluster and start making sense of that data uh, and work near the data, if you will. Right. Um, the second point is, you know, I kind of touched on it in the previous slide, but you know, if I have this kind of periodic processing or a very temporary processing need. Uh, it might make sense just to rent instead of deploying, you know, my own racks of uh, racks of servers and deploying a cluster on it, right? Um, it makes a whole lot of sense just to rent it out, right? And so that's you would use the cloud again. Um, another reason why you would want to go to the cloud, I mean, this is all stuff that really makes sense for almost any technology, but you know, it's no upfront capital expense, right? I can be successful with my project and use the success and the return of my project to actually fund out perhaps my own private cluster, right? So maybe it's a, you know, eventually do you do, you do you know, part off, part on-premise uh, cloud structure, you know, however that's going to be, but 
you know, as you start off, you know, if you don't have the capital expense, go off and, you know, rent space and get some things going uh, and take really the obstacle of funding the project away from really getting to, to some success. Um, you know, it, it's, it is easier to expand a cluster when you're running within the cloud. It's just you're basically expanding the size of what you want, right? And so we've all been through that. I mean, it's exactly a lot of what we're talking about today, right? No need to go out and buy servers. Just find them. Um, and that, that applies across everything. And then, of course, there's this whole eliminating all the networking concerns, right? That's all taken care of you, taken care of for you, right? So there's a longer, it's a longer blog post. I would, you know, highly recommend it to anybody who's, who's more interested in running Hadoop in the cloud. Um, and, and Steve's got some really great stuff there, and he's happy to answer questions. So I'm going to shift a little bit back into kind of what is Apache Hadoop. You know, when I think of Hadoop in general and what it is, really comes down to two things, right? And this is the core of what Hadoop is. It comes down to processing and storage, right? It allows for this massively parallel processing, right? So, these, so you can take really these computationally intense uh, tasks and, and distribute them across, you know, hundreds, thousands of servers. You know, Yahoo's running a 42,000 server cluster right now, right? And they're taking tests and distributing them across these 42,000 machines. And they have the benefit of 42,000, you know, parallel processors dealing with jobs, right? And so it really splits the tasks across processors and, and puts the task very near where the data is being stored, right? Um, it's the baseline of a lot of, of new stuff. And this is really MapReduce. And MapReduce all came out of a paper that was written, written uh, by some Google engineers in 2004. Uh, that's the name of it, MapReduce, Simplified Data Processing on Large Clusters, if you're interested in reading it. It's available out on the web. Um, but really, that was the start of really Hadoop and kind of that was the, the processing side of things. What's, what's genius is the whole budding up the processing with the storage, right? So it's really those two pieces. And, you know, the Hadoop distributed file system um, is not normal file system storage like we would think of. It's, it's distributed, right? It has data across many different nodes. It's natively redundant. And depending on how you set things up, you know, data that you write to your HDFS is going to be uh, copied in multiple different places. So that if you lose a cluster or you lose a, a swatch of clusters, you still have that data, right? It's, it's natively redundant. And there's this key function called a name node, which tracks location of where all the data sits within your, your cluster. It can be five nodes, it can be a thousand, it can be 42,000 like Yahoo, right? And so we know where all the data is at any time. It's HDFS, right? And so those are the two core pieces of what Hadoop is. Hadoop also has several different related projects. And the related projects all came about because, well, we needed to make Hadoop a bit more industrial strength and ready for uh, really the enterprise, right? So as organizations wanted to adopt this, they needed uh, various different functions available within Hadoop, right? So First of all, there's Hive, right? Hive is a, a, a data warehouse infrastructure. It was originally built by Facebook, but allows for these kind of ad hoc queries. It allows you to do all this kind of, you know, a SQL-like language, if you will, called HiveQL, that allows you to interact with it, uh, with the data that's stored in HDFS as if it was kind of a, a data warehouse, if you will, right? But then there's also HBase, and HBase is really growing in popularity. Um, you know, it is a, it's a non-relational database. It's, um, if you've heard of NoSQL, NOSQL databases, uh, it is a NoSQL database, right? It's columnar storage, it's fault tolerant, and really provides uh, uh, provides you you know pro provides you quick access to to large quantities of data, right? Um, lots of information out there about HBase today. Um, H Catalog is another related project, incredibly important. Um, H, H Catalog really was driven out of um, out of Hive. It is the metadata layer that came from Hive, right? It's um, really providing, it's separating out the metadata and the schema and the data model and the way that data is described within HDFS and, and within MapReduce or within Hive or within PIG or whatever the tools are that are deployed within Hadoop. It's separating the data from the metadata so that we could have one single lens or one single view, if you will, into the data itself, right? So it's a metadata layer for Hadoop. And by doing so, we're abstracting that, really, the metadata from the internal tools, but we're also abstracting that so that we can have one single point of access from the outbound as well, from the external side as well. So if we start to think about, you know, how do we put a RESTful API on top of Hadoop? Well, 
H catalog is going to do that for you, really. And it's a key part of actually exposing the platform and opening it up to the rest of the enterprise, right? So I think in order for Hadoop to gain traction and to become kind of a standard functioning on, on within an enterprise, well, we've got to open it up to the rest of the enterprise. It's got to work within the overall eco ecosystem, right? So um, then there's Pig. Pig is a uh, you know it's a it's a language. Well, it's actually a language and, a, and an engine that understands the language and translates things so that you can run things on top of MapReduce, right? Um, it deploys a, a language called Pig Latin. Yes, that is the name of it. It's not Big Pay at and Lay. It's, it's Pig Latin. Um, it's a fairly simple language to understand to, and to develop in. There's several books on it. Uh, and it has a, an engine that understands Pig Latin that will translate what you're trying to do into MapReduce so you can run mass transforms. Um, it's, it's one of the key languages that's used in Hadoop to really accomplish what people are trying to accomplish today and take advantage of this massive parallel processing power. Um, Uzi is, uh, is important when you're... <coughs> Man, excuse me. Oh boy. Uh, Uzi uh, is just a job coordination tool, so I have jobs running in MapReduce and Pig and Hive and all these different things. How do I coordinate them and run them in certain orders and do all these different things? So Uzi was developed to deal with that. Uh, and Bari is a, is a new project. It's an incubator project within Apache. And it really operationalizes Hadoop. You know, how do I install Hadoop? How do I monitor and manage Hadoop? Um, you know, at Hortonworks, we feel that this is a really hugely important project because if Hadoop is going to be adopted across the enterprise, then it's important that I have, you know, my, my operations guys are able to understand what's going on across the cluster. I understand the health. I can start and stop clusters. I can add nodes to the cluster. I can do things like I can provision differently, right? I can improve the performance. How do I do that? Well, today, you need to use CLI, go out, you have an SSH client, you deal with, let's give a web interface on top of this and, and a set of tools that operations is kind of used to dealing with, right? And so that's what Apache Ambari is about. And Ambari is a relatively new, but hugely important for, again, enterprise adoption. And then there's Scoop. Scoop uh, does provide some basic tools to do some data integration, uh, moving data in and out of Hadoop. Uh, you know, there's a handful of connectors for different uh, traditional legacy sources that you have within your organization. And then, you know, if we're going to have all these different projects and all these kind of different pieces going on, uh, somebody's got to be the zookeeper, right? Somebody's got to keep all the animals in line, and that's really what zookeeper is about. It's about you know understanding uh, you know configurations synchronizing across systems and functions within Hadoop. And it's a, another one of those key projects that's really helping, really making Hadoop enterprise ready, ready for the ready for organizations today. So um, how does so how, how is Hadoop being used? Yeah. Um, you know, here at Hortonworks, you know, our customers and, and the organizations we're dealing with really think of it as kind of a, a more of a as a big data refinery, right? So here's an example of you know one way that Hadoop can be used, right? We have log files, you know, being loaded into uh, HDFS, you know, Hadoop distributed file system via APIs, right? And you know these Apache web log files, I mean, there's massive amounts of data. Imagine taking web logs for the past week from say an Amazon. How much data would that be? You know, uh, you know how much data Facebook creates each day. We were at Hadoop Summit. Uh, about a month ago, and I know they were talking about they create something like 100 terabytes of data a day, which is just massive amounts of data. How do I load that? How do I make sense of that, right? There's no way to do structured queries on that. I need to refine that data, right? But so what we see organizations doing is they're taking this massively, perhaps maybe multi-structured content. It could be unstructured. It could be structured. It could be a bunch of different ways. I think log files are definitely structured. But there's a lot of unstructured content, too. And they're buttoning that up with stuff they already have, like order data, customer data, right? The stuff that's coming from your OLTP, right? Uh, it's this traditional source that we're used to, right? How do I take all this and we're going to put it all into this refinery, right? And then we're going to do these processing on it, right? We're going to use joins and we're going to do pig and we're going to use H catalog to overlay metadata on top of it. And what we're going to do is we're going to chunk through this and start to understand the patterns that are found in this data, right? And then ultimately, we're going to interface with H catalog. We're going to use H catalog to actually extract data and bring it out into, say, a visualization to our business analytics, right? And so, I think the refinery concept is really important, right? It's really what allows us to kind of chunk through this data. It's a way of looking at Hadoop and start to make sense for organizations, right? If you think about an oil refinery where we have raw crude oil come in, 
And via different patterns, I'm pulling out, say, petroleum, or I'm pulling out, uh, you know, ultimately plastics, right? It's all the way that I'm actually refining the data to extract what I need from it. So there's a whole concept of data discovery that's going on in the big data world, right? And so how do I use Hadoop to do data discovery to extract the bullets, the key nuggets that I need that I need to fuel into my business analytics application, right? And so those are the type of things, and I think that's the, the general use case that I see used more than others uh, in organizations today. And I think, you know, nine out of ten, that's what they're, do that's what they're using Hadoop for. There's other reasons, and I'll, I'll come into those a little bit, but... You know, in this example, this was a customer of ours. Is trying to, they were trying to understand uh, customer visits to their website. You know, they had, I think, 12% of them were revenue-producing visits. Uh, you know, 15% of them were abandoned carts. You know, so they put something in a cart but then never checked it out. 5% uh, of it was a shallow search. So they went to one to four different pages on the website. But what their biggest concern was was this 68%, right? You know, I have 68% of my visitors are looking at more than four pages, but they're never buying anything. What am I doing wrong? You know, I think before understanding the log files, well, we probably would have attacked, well, wait, I had this abandoned cart thing. You know, why I have so many abandoned carts? But I think the bigger problem is, is I have people visiting a lot of different areas of my website, and I'm not converting them to a, uh, a purchase, right? And so how do I align my resources? How do I, you know, make sure that I'm focusing on the right uh, the right concerns, right? And that's one of the, they, we just weren't able to do this before to do, right? And I think that's a, a key area and kind of one of these kind of key nuggets of information people are pulling away from uh, who do today. So a, a small, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow through a couple slides here because, yeah, I'm, I, I kind of want to focus more on the cloud and, and Apache Hadoop. But, you know, Hortonworks, you know, we believe that by the end of 2015, more than half the world's data will be processed by uh, Apache Hadoop. Um, we're a bit bullish on it, um, but we feel that if we feel aligned with, you know, these these kind of five, you know, segments right here, we'll, we'll definitely do this. And so, you know, we need to be diligent stewards of the open source. We need to be innovating it. Um, provide a robust platform. Enable the ecosystem so that it can be adopted within the organizations and, and make it platform ready, you know, and ready for the enterprise. Um, if people are familiar with uh, Jeffrey Moore, uh, I read his books. They're just amazing. Um, but he has a book called Crossing the Chasm. And if we look at where Hadoop is, and I think if we look at any emerging space, you know, I think the cloud was here a couple years ago. Um, you know, it really it needs to cross the chasm, right? And the, the chasm really sits between early adopters and visionaries and the early majority, right? Early adopters, well, you know, they're very, they're okay with bugs. They're okay with, you know, a steady pace, a very increased pace of innovation, if you will, right? You need to kind of innovate very quickly when you're dealing with early adopters. However, when you do cross the chasm, you get to this early majority, the guys who are, you know, the, the bigger enterprises, you know, more financial services firms, basically, you know, you need stability, right? Now, I think really kind of at this point in time, Hadoop is really kind of balancing between this innovation and stability, you know, with, with, uh, with version one, of Hadoop, which came out last January, we, thought, we saw the first very stable release of Hadoop. And that's really the beginning of, of really jumping the chasm and being applicable to that early majority because they don't have the stomach for, say, security issues or for bugs or, you know, for technologies that haven't been tested in production to the level that, say, you know, Hadoop version 1 has, right? So, you know, we need to innovate, we need to grow, we need all the related projects to go, but we need to balance that with a careful amount of stability so that as we move forward, um, you know, we will be able to cross that chasm and, you know, the early majority will adopt. And I think at Hortonworks, this is our main focus. You know, I mean, you know, Hortonworks is 100% open source. We are, you know, really dedicated to, uh, you know, the, the Apache community. You know, I like to think of our engineers upstairs as kind of, I think they work for both Hortonworks and the, the community, right? I mean, they you know, a whole group of guys here who are committers within, you know, the Apache Hadoop community, uh, community excuse me. Um, what we build and the Hortonworks data platform, which is the product that we come to market with, is, is tightly aligned with the core Apache code line as we possibly can be. Uh, we never really want to be too far away from that code line. We're going to con continually, you know, contribute back as quick as we possibly can, right? And so, you know, if you look at Apache and Mari, well, that's our, our, our monitoring and management console. It's part of our product. You can download it today. Everything we do is 100% open source. There is nothing proprietary. There's no forks in the road. There's, 
it's it's everything is is there, and that's uh you know that's us uh, really being dedicated to open source and really being stewards of the community, if you will. Um, so you know some of the reasons we're different. It's a it's a complete platform, uh, comprehensive management, monitoring, uh, data integration tools, and then you know metadata services, the H catalog stuff that I talked about a little bit earlier, and really um, you know it's this complete platform across all of them. Um, what we've done is we've taken a stack of technologies and pulled them all together, tested them, and proven it. So it's a proven distribution so that uh, we've done all the integration of the various different releases across all the, you know, the core and the related projects, pulled it together and made it very solid, right, so that it is stable and valid for the enterprise. All built on, you know, Hadoop version 1, right? Management and monitoring, I talked a little bit about this. It's the Ambari stuff, right? It's huge. How do I integrate data, right? And I think this is a really important concept for the cloud, right? So if I'm going to move data in and out of Hadoop, and it's massive amounts of data, how am I doing so, right? And so we partnered with a company called Talent so that we can actually bridge the, the gap between legacy data, say DB2 and Oracle, and the cloud, right? They have a bunch of cloud components they've got, you know. So how do I make it graphical and make it easy so I could simplify and speed development, right? And so, you know, ultimately, uh, this is one of my favorite questions here is, you know, what's best for the cloud? You know, do if I need to load, you know, petabytes of data into this cluster somewhere, do I ship a do I ship a hard drive to somebody or am I relying on the internet and some tools to do so? And I think that's really, you know, what's right for you and what can you stomach. But I think it's an important question to ask because you may sit there for days and days and days trying to just load your new cluster because we are dealing with massive amounts of data, right? So really use what's right for you. And then again I'll come back to H catalog, really opening up the platform with the RESTful API and really separating out the metadata from the raw underlying Hadoop data, right? Um, you know, let's put a RESTful API on things to, to open up the platform. So with this, I'm just going to jump out to really why people are implementing Hadoop. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons, but again, I'll come back to Jeffrey Moore. It's really about optimizing outcomes, and it's applicable really everywhere. You know, within media companies, we need to optimize our content. Within intelligence communities, we need to optimize the way on how, how effective we are at detecting fraud and, and identifying criminals, right? Within investment portfolios, I need better algorithms that can act on more data to optimize my investments, right? Within advertising, we need to improve our performance. Within fraud, I need to identify and, and prevent fraud before it happens, right? Compliance within regulation. In retail and wholesale, we've been trying to uh, you know, optimize inventory terms for years, right? Um, this is just another way of using transaction and massive amounts of, of ERP data to deal with that, yeah? Uh, maximizing our supply chain. Healthcare is another big one. If I can look at clinical trials across millions and millions and millions of patients, you know, how, how is that going to optimize outcomes for my patients, right? Learning, and then, you know, citizen services and whatnot, really. So really within any space in the world, really, you know, Hadoop is applicable and really can help op optimize, you know, outcomes at scale. So I'm just going to jump through to the end here. I had a use case in here. I knew I kind of wouldn't get to it, but you know, I did want to jump through you know, the five reasons for Hadoop in the cloud. A, you know, work near the data. The second one, if you're just doing a periodic processing or a very temporary job. Uh, the third one is you know, if you don't have the capital to get started with Hadoop, it might make sense. The third one is it's really easy to expand. You don't need to go out and buy things. Let's just find them. And then the fifth, eliminating network concerns. So with that, um, I did have a, a couple of minutes here left uh, for questions, and I'm happy to take those. So um, thank you, everybody, first, and uh, I'll, I'll open up to questions now, Geraldine. Great, thanks. Um, we have a clarification question here. So you had a slide where you talked about um, uh, Hadoop versus um, what Horton Works provides. And the question is, um, Hadoop is a collection of projects, so what do you mean uh, by Hadoop on that slide? What's the context of that, right? All of the projects in the umbrella or a specific component um, yeah. in the umbrella? Yeah, so it's, I mean, a quick clarification. So just Apache Hadoop really is the core. And the core is MapReduce and HDFS. It's the first slide with the two components on That is Hadoop. There's a bunch of related projects that work within really the Hadoop ecosystem, and that was the seven different projects I put onto the next slide, the eight different projects across Embari and HCatalog and Hive and HBase. They all live on top of Hadoop to really accomplish what they want to accomplish, right? And so um, while there are separate tracks and developments, they're led by different project management chairs, 
there's different leads, there's different committers who are working on, say, HBase and H catalog and these different things. Um, they're all living on top of really core Hadoop. And core Hadoop is MapReduce and HDFS, right? So, you know, Hadoop is kind of MapReduce and HDFS, and then there's a lot of related projects around Apache Hadoop that are actually, you know, uh, adding a extended benefit on top of it. So that's pure open source community, right? And all these things are available off the Apache Software Foundation website. Um, then there's Hortonworks Data Platform. What we've done is we've taken really the most stable release across Hadoop, MapReduce, and HDFS, and all the most stable releases across the related projects, and we've tied them together, tested them, hardened them, and bought them to market so that you don't have to go through the process of building it all yourself. It's kind of like, uh, you know, it's like we chose all the best Lincoln logs and built a house and said, here you go, guys, you have a solid house to actually build on top of that, right? So I guess it's not the best metaphor, but um, that's really kind of the, the difference between the two. I hope that answers the question. Uh, I, I hope that was good enough, Geraldine. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, we'll look for clarification in case there's any. Um, so uh, a question from an individual who wants to know, you know, what do you need to understand to get started with Hadoop? So what type of background do you need? Yeah, well, um, there's a whole bunch of people who are involved with Hadoop these days. You know, if I look at the past year, it was mostly technical people a year ago. You know, today there's business analysts and there's a whole other world of people who are you know, building on top of this. Those aren't the people who are implementing. So I think from a big data point of view, and I think about that as the business and those people, you know, I don't think everybody needs to be a data scientist. I think they need to drive their, their vendors and the application providers to use big data so they can use them. So that's, let's just separate that whole world of people away from the technology people, which I think is more the important part of the question. Um, you know, Hadoop has been fairly complex. And MapReduce, it's been really complex for the past couple of years. I think we're getting to the point where, you know, it isn't as complex as it used to be. We're finding tools that are built on top of it that are abstracting this knowledge to a level of, you know, maybe there's graphical interfaces, right? And so, you know, we look at partner companies like Talend, who's doing, you know, data integration for HDFS, and, and you know, they're doing all the code generation for you. So there's very kind of, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a wealth of tools out there that abstract the complexity of the dupe so that you don't need to under, you know, understand the underlying MapReduce. You don't need to understand Pig Latin, right? You can actually just build via these graphical components. So that's kind of the, the second layer of the onion, right? So there's tools out there. If you want to deal directly with MapReduce and you want to deal directly with HDFS, you want to become a committer, or you want to get deeper into the stack of the technology, um, you know, you're going to have to understand Java, that's for sure. You're going to have to understand Linux. You're going to have to understand, you know, how you pipe commands from one to the next, because ultimately, that's really what the structure is built on. There's several different papers out there, a lot of different places for you to learn about that. You know, ultimately, it comes down to, you know, are you qualified to do some sort of training? And there's a lot of training um, uh, courses out there and, and opportunities for people to take. We have Hortonworks University. I think we have a three-day intro to, to Hadoop course. It goes through all these different things. We have courses for developers, courses for administrators, right? Because the administrator is a whole other world, right, Carolyn? Um, you're a developer, but you're, you're admin I need to just deploy this cluster. They don't need to code. They just need to know how to manage the thing, right? So there's a lot of different ways to take that question because several different people are going to be involved. But I think I covered most of them, right? So there's, you know, application developers, operations, and then people who are kind of the analytics guys who are building on top of it. So I think that's the best, best answer I can give. Great, thanks. Okay, so another question: um, um, What's the difference between uh, you know Apache Hadoop and Cassandra? Hadoop and Cassandra. So Cassandra is a NoSQL database, um, and it is you know a very quick database. It's built on top of MapReduce. Um, I don't know the intricate details of Cassandra. It's not my area of expertise. I focus mostly on Hadoop, um, but Cassandra is used for very explicit functions. I believe Cassandra, I think it was Cassandra that was built out of um, Facebook chat. I believe that was its original genesis. I, I can't give you the exact uh, differences, but you know, if you look at Cassandra as a NoSQL database, well, within the H H Apache Hadoop stack, we also have HBase, right? And HBase is a NoSQL database. So 
it's really giving you kind of um, you know a, a columnar database on top of it that's very fast for explicit purposes. So you know I go to you know DataStax is a, a distribution vendor for Cassandra. They've got a lot of information out there about why that's applicable. Um, but within the core of Apache Hadoop stack, there is HBase, which is you know also an alternative for you to use uh, uh, as a NoSQL um, uh, choice, if you will. Great, and that's one of the things we love about op open source, right? Lots of choices. Um, so uh, a more technical question, yeah. kind of, can you explain to us um, what's involved in writing queries to make use of the data? Well, I mean, writing queries, you're going to use several different, I mean, there's several different ways that you can write queries that are going to take use of the data. Um, I talked about Apache Pig. So Pig is going to allow you to write transforms. So, it allows you to kind of chunk through the data to identify you want to, what you want to do. You know, you can do joins, you can do aggregates, you can do sorts, you can do a bunch of different things with Pig. There's a lot of different functions within Pig that allow you to deal with the data. Um, but if you want to do just pure queries against it, well, then I would use something like HCatalog to write a query against it, right? So you have a whole metadata layer where you can write a SQL-like query against your big data. Um, there's also HiveQL, which is a, a query language. It's like SQL that allows you to interact with your HDFS data or your, your big data as well with that's found in Hadoop, right? Um, so there's several different methods. It just really depends on what you're comfortable with using. Um, you know, HiveQL again and HBase as well. It's giving give you a SQL-like interface on top of it, right? Um, so if you're comfortable with those languages, you can interact with Hadoop. Now, is it the most simple? You need to understand Linux. You, under, you need to understand, you know, how to interact with that via command line. Um, but again, there's also tools like Talon that are allowing you to run these queries via a you know a, a graphical set of tools that's allowing you to drop a component onto a palette, uh, configure the component, and it's creating all the code underneath for you. So you don't need to understand the Java to wrap around it. It's building the query and the Java so that you can self-contain the service and deploy it anywhere and and run your query. So I think you know you can get as deep as you want technically. Um, but there's also tools that are being developed that allow you to abstract those complexities up into kind of more graphical interfaces on top of these things. And I think, you know, I think that's a, it's a direction of the market and really a direction of the platform in general. Um, you know, you think about Spring and what that did within, you know, that space. You know, how are we going to build tool sets to, to allow people to build applications quicker? And I think we're going to see a lot more tools being developed and deployed on top of Hadoop over the next year and next, you know, really six months. It's a key area of advancement for really the entire ecosystem to grow with us. Great, thanks. So two more questions. Um, the, the first one is about server level considerations. So basically what do you need to run Hadoop? You know, what do you need in terms of CPU, memory, disk? And is there some type of best practices guide that you can point us to that might contain this information? Yeah. So actually, we have a sizing guide which helps you understand, you know, what you want to accomplish and really kind of where you want to go with it. Um, you, know, I, you know, from a cluster point of view, you know, Hadoop doesn't make sense if you aren't going to have five nodes in your cluster. Anything lower than that, it, you know, it's just not, it's not built for that, right? It's built for kind of intense processing, right, across large amounts of data. So, you know, we're talking about, you know, 20 terabyte chunks of data, if you will, right? If you... If you look at your normal rack, you know, it's going to come with, you know, a quad processor with, you know, X amount of, of storage space. So we are talking about fairly sizable applications, right? I mean, it's, it's called big data for a reason. I mean, there is a volume thing here going on, right? So um, I think depending on what you want to accomplish, you know, we have a sizing guide that we'd be happy to work with you and work through, you know, what it is you're trying to accomplish. But I think that's you're really the core. The, the bare minimum is really, I would say, five nodes in your cluster. Um, and you know, at least probably at least 20 terabytes of data, and and we can work with you through those things. But I think that's a general starting point. It scales as far as you want to go from there, right? Uh, really, kind of as far as we want to think. Great. Was thanks. there a second part of that question, Gerald? Um, no, that was it. You you kind of shared that uh, with us. Um, so one other question, one last question. We we are at time. Um, is there a plan to provide the HortonWorks platform? Um, as a service, basically as a, as a cloud service offering? Yeah, so I know um, we have one today within AWS. It's there. 
Uh, the AMI is available today. Actually, if you look at our sandbox, you can start one up. To, you can start the Hadoop cluster up today. Um, so if you go to hortonworks.com, I think on the slash download page, or actually in the getting started page, the the second option here. Uh, if you go into, I believe the IT operations, IT operators, or the developers, you'll you'll see that there's a sandbox available, and that'll direct you exactly how to deploy that uh, within a cloud service today. Um, I also have a, a blog post that's being run about how you would actually deploy this on top of it, uh, S4 today. So um, expect a lot more out of us to, to help the community. I mean, the product is only, I believe, two weeks old or three weeks old at this point. So you know, we're building up a lot of things to help people deploy that in a, in a cloud environment as well. Great. Thanks. And, and Jim, thank you very much for uh, joining us today to give us uh, this great overview presentation. Um, you know, Hadoop is an area of a, of a lot of complexity, and um, you helped uh, clarify a lot for us today. Great. Well, thank you for inviting me, Geraldine, and I'm happy to take questions as follow-up uh, to this webinar and happy to share the information with everybody, anybody who's interested. So, again, thanks for taking your time, everybody. Happy to be here.